You're watching Zoo Tours, the channel that takes you on a virtual field trip to the zoo. Welcome to Tropical Asia, where you're invited to step away from a concrete jungle to get lost in what looks like the real thing. In June 1985, the Bronx Zoo unveiled what was widely considered the most ambitious exhibit ever created. While Chicago's Brookfield Zoo just completed the largest indoor zoo exhibit in the world, within a year, Bronx not only had an answer of their own, but they raised the standards, placing you in one of the most convincing zoological attractions you will ever see. With four ecosystems, 30 individual habitats, nearly 70 species under one 55-foot tall roof. Before we explore this award-winning building any further, if this is your first tour, please hit those like, sub, and bell buttons so you can officially be a part of this tour group. And as a thank you for providing us with some of his own footage, subscribe to the Virtual Zoo, who could really use your help right now hitting that 1,000 follower milestone. As you probably saw on my own introduction video of the zoo, I started my New York journey in the Asia Gate. I followed the flow of the crowd and thought I was gonna see the entrance of Jungle World just beyond this bend, but there were a few extra features that I did not expect to come across. I was only here for two days, but I made it a personal tradition of mine to always walk under these temple ruins. It felt like good luck and it put me in the jungle mood. The first species that you'll see has nothing to do with Jungle World. Across the pond barrier are dromedary camels, a domestic species that's most associated with Africa, but they actually do fit this area's theme since they also thrive in Western and Central Asia. As you walk further into the plaza where the zoo used to offer camel rides, this is where I found out Jungle World shares this corner with the wild Asia monorail, but that's for another time. We're almost there, but not before you're drawn to this small flight cage, which is dedicated to the very endangered Waldrap Ibis. When you get to this point, remember, the left side of the rope takes you to the Bengali Express monorail, and the right side of the rope leads you to Jungle World. Now it is extra admission. You can either purchase your ticket at the kiosk right here, or pay for the full experience package online. As soon as you enter, you can't help but look up at the array of tall bamboo shoots and hanging tapestries. I couldn't find what they represent in my research, but they're still a nice touch to the building nonetheless. Since this is mostly an Asian attraction, one big difference with this. In Minnesota's, Omaha's, and Brookfield's rainforests, it's not organized by continents, rather by environments. The zoo describes the scrub forest as seasonally dry with low growing trees, with infertile soil and infrequent rainfall that restricts diversity. Along this riverbank, you'd run into Asian small clawed otters. Forget Times Square, Statue of Liberty, and sad Yankees fans, the smallest of the 13 otter species should be up there on New York's list of must-see attractions. Cute, obviously, but longtime Bronx Zoo fans know this is a case of looks are deceiving. I don't have the heart to exactly tell you why, but let's just say the zoo won't be mixing them with monkeys anytime soon. Don't be surprised of what you Google right after watching this, because after all, they are carnivores. If you tell the average person right here to look for a kangaroo, you can't blame them if they start by looking down. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the tree kangaroo. All of those walk through Australia exhibits might give you the idea that a kangaroo got tired of the desert one day and just climbed a tree. Well, almost. The first kangaroo ancestors were tree climbers and the lush forests of what we call Australia and New Guinea today started drying up, and so they were forced to walk on the ground. When the rainforests started coming back, the macropods started climbing trees again, which eventually blessed us with this. If you see the tree kangaroo by itself, be sure to look around or be patient, because you might just find the Rodriguez fruit bat. If bats make you a little uneasy, look at this sign to calm you down. Some cultures see bats as good luck and are even a sign of a long and healthy life. 
The scrub forest becomes the mangrove forest, and you're met with a small but very well detailed example of a mangrove shoreline. Pretty sure it has or had mudskippers and archer fish. What's an archer fish? Well, the display right across from this will tell you and show you how they hunt. Below the surface, I saw a very friendly Rhode Island snake-necked turtle. But there is a reason why there's so much space above the surface. You don't want to miss the Indonesian sailfin lizard, an omnivorous reptile that sticks to meat when they're young and finds a balance of fruits and veggies as they age. Sounds like the exact opposite of my own diet plan. Now they're still hunters, but don't put up much of a fight when hunted. Like a basilisk lizard, they can get away by running on the surface of the water. This next one is iconic to zoo enthusiasts. Not only did the designers knock it out of the park by making an exhibit built in 1985 still look this good, but it was first home to the Proboscis Monkey, a pot-bellied, long-limbed, long-nosed primate every zoo fanatic dreams of getting a glimpse of. I believe five parks in America had them in the 70s, including right here. Unfortunately, they're not easy to take care of. I'd love to have them on this channel one day, but I'm gonna need one of you to go to Singapore to make that happen. It's a huge loss, but I think the ebony lingers fill the void quite nicely. Not many can pull off sideburns, a full beard, bangs, and bed hair all at once. True to their name, their fur is glossy black. They're not like black howler monkeys where girls and boys have different colored fur. So what's with the orange one? Langer babies are born bright orange and their fur darkens as they grow up. Some eastern ebonies will stay orange their entire lives. Doesn't do wonders to their camo, but lucky for them and sad for the circle of life, their natural predators are either extinct or on the verge of extinction. That still doesn't stop humans from destroying their habitat for agriculture. But you know what they can't destroy? Their trees in Jungle World. These are supposed to be white mangroves, a tropical tree that thrives in hot, muddy, saltwater conditions that otherwise would kill a lot of non-aquatic plants. A lot of mangrove species can filter out the salt that gets into their roots by excreting it out of their leaves. Last episode, we learned at an aquarium that mangroves are, in a way, just as important as coral reefs. They stop erosion, protect the shoreline from storm damage, and as you can see, give other species a home. Things get really dark in the rainforest introduction gallery, but it's not necessarily a nocturnal gallery. In fact, I don't think this is an animal exhibit at all, rather a very wet demonstration on why the rainforest needs lots and lots of rainfall. What looked like a former exhibit has an obstructed view that makes you look past the brush to see photos of rainforest species. There is one living animal in this gallery, and that is the invisible Northern Luzon Giant Cloud Rat. But luckily for me, there is one in the mouse house that wasn't shy. So we're gonna wait to properly present the species when we get to that part of the zoo. In the zoo's intro video, I raved about Bronx's creative use of signage, but I gave all the credits to the Congo Gorilla Forest team when I should have mentioned Jungle World. The Jungle Products corner shows that the rainforest is the source of a lot of our food, medicine, and other common products, revealing that tropical rainforests can play a part in our lives every single day, and we don't even know it. Through these doors, is a gateway to the lowland evergreen rainforest. Iconic in its own right, even before I made a visit, this was the first thing I pictured whenever I thought of the zoo. I love how the rocks frame your perspective. It makes you only focus on the most natural looking parts of the display. There's water falling right in front of your face, a large amount of vines that creates an obstacle course. The only thing that was missing was the blanket of mist that I've seen in a lot of photos that originally led me to believe the silvered langers were completely surrounded by water and were encouraged to only live in the trees. Rather than mangroves, this spotlights buttress roots. Some trees don't have underground root systems that are strong enough to support it. So these kinds of trees usually have buttress roots that grow outward from the trunk and above the ground to prevent it from falling over. Now, if you can't get enough langers in your life, the Bronx Zoo does have a live cam on their website that always points on this exhibit. We are emerging from the cave. There's an open patch in the canopy. The sunlight peeks through and shines on everyone's favorite long-nosed pachyderm, the Malayan Taper. 
How are my zoo tours vets feeling? You tired of seeing them yet? Me neither. We've learned so far they evolved 50 million years ago. There are three recognized species in South America, and one, this one, is found in Asia. But I've never really explained what a taper is. To simply put it, they are ungulates, more specifically odd-toed ungulates, an order they share with about 16 other species, including horses and rhinos. Bronx is considered to have the best of America's few all-indoor taper displays, not just because they have the most space. They can share this with 20 other species that call this canopy home. I only spotted more flying foxes and the more obvious, impressive lesser adjutant storks, along with a few others that we will see down the path. Malayan tapers are strong and quicker than they look, but they still have to deal with tigers, Asian wild dogs, and a few sources mentioned the leopard that stalks along our eye line on what's supposed to be the horizontal branches of a massive banyan tree. If you can't tell, the back barrier is also made of glass, letting you and the leopard see the rest of the Langer estate, setting up the first predator and prey display we've seen in a while. Leopards are a Langer's natural predator, but not this one. Bronx exhibits the Amur leopard of Far East China and Russia. We've learned many times now that pure African and tropical Asian leopards are either scarce or don't exist at all in American parks. And the association of zoos and aquariums wants zoos to focus on Amurs because they are so endangered. However, their habitat is not tropical. Clouded leopards, which I'm pretty sure used to be in here, definitely made a little more sense. Pachyderms, big cats and monkeys are the most seen, but invertebrates and other small creatures are by far the most abundant and most diverse animals in the rainforest. And the unseen multitude gallery really lets you know it. The first 14 displays lets you get really close to six kinds of stick insects. The weevil beetle, black stag beetle, a beetle named after a mythological Greek titan condemned to hold up the heavens for an eternity. My new favorite creepy crawly is the legendary looking frog beetle. It's iridescent and has legs like a frog. They are not necessarily used for jumping. It's hypothesized that they use them for defense. Guys use them to attract a date or to keep a tight grip on branches. And it's not just bugs. These magnificent tree frogs really set up for some pretty romantic shots. They're so magnificent they don't even have their own sign. Oh, and because of the sacks of poison on top of their heads, it's relatively harmless to us, but strong enough to make a snake or a bird spit them back out. I want one of you to tell me if you've ever found the bearded dragon, because I could only see the more obvious frilled dragon. If they want to say, get away from me, all they have to do is run on their hind legs like us, or they can spread their large frills around their neck. Yes, just like the Dilophosaurus in Jurassic Park. For all the snake fans out there, Jungle World does have a carpet python. For all the Scandentia fans out there, you can add the Northern Tree Shrew to your can't miss list. The zoo says their name is very misleading. They're not even related to shrews, and they spend most of their time foraging on the ground. They were classified under the now abandoned group Insectivora, with hedgehogs, moles, and shrews. But at the same time, scientists argued that they were actually primates, before eventually being split into their own separate order. Remember looking at all this and thinking, wow, I wish there was a way I could get close to that. The Unseen Multitude's final window not only gives you another angle, but brings you to the edge of the forest. I got to see eggs, which I'm pretty sure were props, a prop corpse flower, because if it were real, Jungle World would have no visitors. And I spotted a greater Malaysian mouse deer. But you know who really loves this window? The zoo's female northern white-cheeked gibbon. This is Chi Yu. She has all this space to roam, yet I hear she chooses to spend a lot of her time with us. And as you might expect, she can draw a crowd and cause a frenzy within seconds. Her species, on the other hand, doesn't get this kind of appreciation in the wild. Deforestation, logging, hunting, and military conflicts have made them critically endangered. If only she could somehow comprehend this crowd proves a lot of people around the world would do anything to protect them. 
goodbyes are never easy, and I don't know when I'll get that kind of opportunity again. But in this case, a goodbye is necessary to get to my favorite exhibit in Jungle World. First, we have to take a little break outside where you're given a view of the Bronx River, which I guess technically is the most natural part of this attraction. Just a few more steps, and that places us in the humidity of Jungle World's final realm, the Lower Montane Forest reveals what's on the other side of the Gibbon Forest. With the Bronx River right outside, the Bronx Zoo one-upped nature with their own river. That's a little more interesting. As you walk to get a better view, hopefully you'll appreciate the canopy above your head that really enhances this building's realism and immersion. And as you go further along the path, you're actually going against the flow of the river and given an underwater view of its source. Filled with a bunch of fresh water wonders, like fly river turtles, giant Malaysian river turtles, and the impossible to miss giant Goramis. But we all know the landmark species is the Indian Gharial. Not gator, not a croc, Gharial. The Bronx Zoo emphasizes just how vital rivers are to their survival. It's where their food is, and they really only leave the riverbank to nest or bask in the sun, because they, they really don't move well on land. However, when farmers plant crops and bring their livestock to the river for a drink, they destroy nesting sites. And you have sand mining and damming that ruins the flow and depths of the rivers. And then you have fishermen who unintentionally trap and kill them in their nets. This is why the Gariel deserves this episode's conservation spotlight. Their population has just been on a catastrophic decline. The Bronx Zoo supports Gariel Conservation Alliance that conducts population surveys public awareness campaigns, and rewild captive bred gharials. If stopping this crocodilian's threats in person isn't on your schedule, you can still do them a favor by donating through the links in the comments. With the existence of zoos, there will always be a connection between us and wildlife, but that connection can go even further when we are given an immersive glimpse of how these animals live in the wild and when we are told how their natural homes are being destroyed. There's a sign in Jungle World that answers the question, what does the extinction of a species mean? With a quote by a former Michigan representative who once said that living wild species are like a library of books that are still unread. Our needless destruction of them is akin to burning the library without ever having read its books. With Jungle World's feature, that now means you can explore all four of America's mega indoor rainforests on zoo tours. Now the next time you hear from me, we'll just walk right outside of Jungle World and continue in this Asia realm on the famous Bengali Express monorail. So until next time, please stay tuned, stay wild, see if you can answer this episode's trivia question, and thank you all for watching Zoo Tours.